Constitución, como todo el... el... Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's the Q, covering Red Hat Summit 2017, brought to you by Red Hat. We are wrapping up day two of the Cube's coverage here at the Red Hat Summit here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Rebecca Knight. I'm here with Stu Miniman. Stu, we started off the morning with Jim Whitehorse, CEO of Red Hat, saying planning is dead. We, 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 we work so hard to infer order where there is none. You're an analyst, you're a forecaster, so I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's, it's not, it's, stop trying. Yeah, that's, thanks Rebecca, it's been great. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's funny, right, we, I, I've looked at this uh, from the analyst world, uh, read, read a uh, book recently called Black Swan mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Nassim Tlaib, talks about how um, really trying to predict uh, you know, some of these big game changers is, is really challenging. That being said, you know, I've been involved in some technologies early. It's like, I remember like playing with the internet and you know, when the first, you know, graphical browsers came out and being like, this is going to be a game changer. I had no idea where it was going, uh, but there. I was, happened to be involved really early in like the VMware virtualization days. I, I started talking to Docker really early. I don't say I'm predicting the future, but you know, here at Red Hat, communities, you know, Jim, we, we asked Jim Whitehurst about, you know, you, you, you build on communities and I feel I've, I've got a pretty strong network. I'm, I'm tied in a lot through social these days uh, and feel like I can kind of get the, you know, where's the interesting stuff happening and where is it just maybe a little bit too, uh, you know, the hype doesn't meet the reality. And one of the other things, right, is how long it takes for certain technologies to kind of mature, what it will look like when it comes through. Um, you know, it's easier to bet on the waves as opposed to some of the particular tools out there. Uh, uh, you know, we, we had I really loved the conversation with Jim Whitehurst. I always feel like I'm doing one of those executive case studies. Uh, you know, uh, th that you take like uh, you know a a at a good business school when you get to sit down and talk with them. I, I agree. He, he's a great conversationalist, a, gr a great guy. During his keynote, and even when he sat down with us, he was talking about the management challenge of. Um, of technology leaders today, and, and this is reflective of the theme of this year's conference, which is empowering the individual, and he said that the, the, the role of the leader today is to create the context for the individual to try and modify and try again and fail. Um, my question for you is, it implies that the individual was unempowered beforehand. I mean, it, is, is that accurate? I mean, were, and did engineers not have a voice? Yeah, no, it, it, it's, what is the role of the individual worker? You know, do they know where they're going? Do they? Do we have a shared, clear vision? You know, you talk about most companies; they have their mission statement, and you know, you do studies, and 70 to 80 percent of most companies, of most people in companies, are like, "I'm disconnected from the work. I don't understand how what I do translates to where I'm going." Uh, Red Hat is, you know, an interesting you know, different, uh, you know, company. It's, it's about 10,000 people. We've heard from many of the Red Adders that it doesn't feel and act like that company. Uh, you know, go back to, you know, this is the kind of the military style, you know, hierarchy that most businesses have, you know, kind of the, you know, the structure there. Red Hat is a lot flatter, uh, you know, we, we, we talk in kind of the DevOps world about like two pizza groups. Well, you know, Red Hat's committed, com, uh, involved in all of these various projects. I mean, you know, hundreds of them that they're involved. It's not, you know, one or two open source things. It's all over the place. And you, you kind of put your business hat on like, well, okay, how do you understand how to, you know, which do you drive and which ones create money and how are you working in the right place or are people just contributing to stuff that you hope if I put good stuff out there in good code, eventually it will translate to our business. But you know, Red Hat keeps delivering, keeps growing their base. They've, you know, made certain acquisitions and, and they keep moving forward. So I want to talk about those acquisitions because yeah. we had some Ansible uh, people on the show here today. It, it seems as though the acquisition ha has really gone well and the two companies are blending and, and, and it's setting itself up for success. Is that your take too? Or I mean, what, what do you, what do you, see as potential obstacles down the road. Yeah, that, that's great, Rebecca. We got to talk with uh, you know three different angles of the Ansible uh, team today, and 18 months after the acquisition, it's really broadly integrated. I can tell you, I've worked in big companies, I've worked through a number of acquisitions. 18 months from acquisition to, oh my gosh, their secret sauce is like all over the place. I'm like, that is quite impressive. Um, it, it shows they're a software company, uh, they are agile in their development, and you know they, they get to move things forward. And 
I had heard great things about Ansible before the acquisition. I hear good things from customers that are using it. Some of the other companies in the space that are standalone, uh, you know, have been facing some challenges. Is uh, you know the, the 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 third interview that we did, uh, I, I talked a little bit about how cloud providers, you know, are starting to build some of those pieces in. Infrastructure companies, you know, have known for a long time that management is one of those big challenges. So, uh, you know, management still seems to be one of those jump balls. It feels like that beach ball bouncing around and every. Everybody's trying to get a hold of it, uh, but uh, you know, Red Hat's figuring out how to bake Ansible in, uh, make sure it's you know touching like OpenShift specifically, uh, you know, all those things like the cloud forms and insights uh, and all the other pieces. So um, you know, building in mod uh, more automation fits a lot with what they're doing and how the Linux administrators you know understand how to do things. Um, you know, they, they always wanted to get past, you know, oh great, I have to go create yet another script and another script and another script. Uh, they'll, they'll do that, so, um, it, you know, seems to be, a, you know, a, a great acquisition for them uh, and helping to move them forward in a lot of spaces. Another buzzword we heard a lot today, and it's going to be funny that I'm going to describe this as a buzzword, but it's simple, simplified. This is what we kept hearing again from partners, saying that this is what they're hearing from customers because they just have so many different applications. They've got old infrastructure, new infrastructure, the cloud, they've got hybrid, and they just want things to work together and play nicely. We, they're coming out with solutions. Are they solutions? Are they in fact simpler? What's your take? I mean, are you skeptical that things are in fact yeah. getting simpler? Yeah, Rebecca, there's a line I use. The, the simple enterprise is an oxymoron. Okay. It does not <laughs> exist. If you look at any enterprise today, how many applications they'd have? It's like, well, do you have hundreds of applications or thousands of applications, depending on how old you are, what the size of your, your company is. Um, Everything in IT is additive. We had, uh, you know, one somebody on this week was talking about, you know, the AS400 sitting in the back. We had HPE on. I'm sure they've got lots of customers still running Superdomes. We cover the mainframe pieces, um, and oh well, Red Hat Enterprise Linux lives on lots of these environments. So we're going to standardize the software pieces, but it's there's only pieces of the puzzle that I can simplify and you know, really building software that can live in many environments and help me move towards, uh, you know, more composable uh, or distributed architectures is the way we need to go. Um, I like Red Hat stories to wh where they're taking us, but I, I think if you talk to most IT staffs, even if they're like, oh yeah, we're doing a lot of public cloud or, you know, we've standardized on a couple of pieces of things, most people don't think that IT is simple. And, and then there's the, the the cost too. I mean, I think that one of our one of our guests made this point about proprietary software and how it really is it has a higher bar because customers are going to say, why can't I just get this on open source? Why why do I have to pay for this? And so that's another question too. Where are you seeing the financials of this all play out? Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. We're talking a lot about hybrid cloud, and uh, you know, when we first started talking public cloud, it was like, oh, wait, it'll be cheaper. And then it's like, wait, no, it'll help me be more agile, um, and maybe that will then lead to cost. It was like, uh, you know, uh, there's the, the the old faster, cheaper, better. Uh, there, there are certain people in the development culture that's like, well, if I can just do faster, 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 it will make up for everything else. Uh, then again, if we move too fast, sometimes we're breaking things. We're not being able to take advantage of things. So. Uh, it goes back, to, we, is this that simple? It sure doesn't <laughs> sound simple. So it, it's, you know, IT is a complex world. Uh, pricing is one of those things that, that absolutely is getting sorted out. Um, you know, Red Hat has a, a nice position in the marketplace. When I look at, you know, the big companies in the market, you know, and you take, okay, software companies like a Microsoft or an Oracle, one of the first things most people thinks about, think about when you hear those companies is like, oh, their price. Red Hat has you know, broad adoption and a lot of customers, and do I hear issues here or there on certain product lines where yes, they'd like it cheaper or uh, there? Yes, but it's not a general complaint. Oh, well, hey, you want to do, you know, let's just use the Fedora version or the CentOS version rather than the full enterprise version, and they have some sliders to be able to you know, manage with that. Um, you know, starting to hear more, you know, uh, kind of the elastic cloud-like pricing uh, from Red Hat and some of their partners that they solution uh, the, the, these pieces with. So, yeah, uh, you know, pricing isn't simple yet. Uh, it's definitely something that uh, we're, we're going to see more and more as we kind of get to that cloud-like model. Today, as particularly in the morning keynote, um, some of the use cases were from the government. We had three, including British Columbia, which we just had on our show, also Singapore. 
so it, it sounds as though government is saying, wait, what is this open source? This, this can really help us. This can help us engage our citizens and help make their lives easier. And also, by the way, make it easier for us to govern. Do you, will government sort of always lag behind? Or do you think that there is a possibility that government could really lead the way on a lot of these well, things? Well, it, it, it's funny, because we've always, we've known for a long time that government typically doesn't get a lot of budget. So when they go to do something, First of all, they sometimes can leapfrog a generation or two because they've waited, they've waited, they've waited, and I can't necessarily upgrade well, it, so I might to need to it. skip a generation. Uh, secondly, um, you know, government has, if we talk about things like IoT and you know, all of those data points out there, data has gravity, data's the new oil, Government has a lot of data. You know, uh, interest. You just uh, interviewed British Columbia. I'm sure. You know, there's the opportunity there that as data can be leveraged and turned into more value. Working with entrepreneurs, working with communities. Government now sits in a place where if they can be a little bit more open and they can take advantage of this new opportunity, they can actually be on the vanguard of some of these new technologies. Anything you got from your interviews? Yes. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, I think that. One of the things that really struck me was the recruiting and retention piece because that seems to be one of, one of the hardest things. If you're a, if you're a if you're a hot coder, or an engineer who's graduating from one of the best schools, it's going to take a lot to get you to go work for the government. It just will. Oh my God, Re Rebecca, I did like you know when I was in college, I did an internship for a municipal government. I you know digitized all their land management, did a whole database creation, and you know did one of those things. You know the old process took two months, and when I was done with it, it could be anywhere from two minutes to you know maybe a little bit longer, but. Boy, that was a painful summer to work through some of the processes. Their infrastructure was all antiquated. Great people, but you know, government moved at a slower speed well, than and, I'm used to. And that is <laughs> what I got out of my interview. Yeah. So they are using the same kind of tools that these coders and developers would be using in the private sector. They're also um, doing smaller engagements. So it's you don't you're not signing your life away to the government. You're able to work on a stint here, a stint there. You can do it in your free time and then get paid on PayPal. So I think that that is one way to to attract attract good talent. Stu, we got one more day of this. Yeah. What, what, what do you hope to see tomorrow? What are you going to be looking for? What do, you, what do you want to be talking about tomorrow at this time? Yeah, well, what we, what we always get here is a lot of really good customers. I love the innovation stories. Right past the hallway here, there's, there's all of these pictures, and Red Hat's a great partner for us on theCUBE. They've brought us many of those customers. We're going to have more of them on. You know, another two keynotes, uh, f full day of coverage. So, uh, you know, we'll see how many people make it to the morning keynote after going to Fenway tonight. <laughs> 4,000 people. Pretty impressive, uh, you know. I, I think we'll see. It's not like we'll see more red in the audience than usual at, at a game at Fenway, but uh, yeah, you, you, you'll root for the home team. Uh, I, I, I'm a transplant here. Uh, go Pats, mm, you know. <laughs> mm, okay, all right. So that's the argument I think that they were hoping for. Yeah. So I want to thank you so much. And, uh, it's been great doing this with you, and I hope you will join us tomorrow for day three of the Red Hat Summit in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. Thank you, and see you tomorrow.